uh, and the, what's our next step would be the anterior wax up. And this is one of the wax up that I did during my residency. And I was just so excited with my first full mouth wax up and I couldn't resist taking so many photographs. And this is one of them. And, uh, you know, the anterior coupling, it's a term by bros and, you know, later you will see the long century concept that I will discuss. But anterior coupling basically means we need to have such a morphology of the anterior regions in order to have the immediate disocclusion with a shallow guidance. And uh, buffer space by Frediati is, you know, when your patient's in the eccentric, you know, the excursive movement, you need to have certain millimeter of the disocclusion on the posterior to prevent any traumatic occlusion after attrition of uh, the patient teeth. Progressive disocclusion by nephology would be you know, whenever you, you're thinking the canines compromise, uh, you know, and then later you will have an issue, you think you will have an issue with the canine guidance, then you do the wax up from the posterior tooth to the front. So those are kinds of concepts when you're doing your wax up, whether you're doing it on your own or your, your lab technician is helping you out. But, you know, those are foundational concepts that you should have in order to do the proper, you know, understanding of the dynamics of the tooth morphology. And, you know, just briefly going over the history of occlusion, uh, you know, a lot of times we hear about the occlusion, but where is it exactly coming from? Uh, you know, the occlusion is, is originated with the nephology and the McCollum is the father of nephology. And at that time, they, their, their concept was having bilateral balance, denture occlusion. You, you know, when you're denture occlusion, you would like to have as much teeth contact as possible. That's the exact concept at the time. So they're preferring for the balanced occlusion envelope of motion using the pantograph tracing so that they know exactly where the TMJ is moving and you know the, the centric the pure hinge axis as well as the centric the the CR the mandibular centricity and the CR so uh, and the followed by the Diamico and Schuyler they came up with the cuspid protection mutually protected occlusion and now we're in the phase of the Penkin and Schuller phase where the freedom in centric the point contact, the increasing the potential trauma, but they came up with this concept with the Munson's sphere theory, Mayer's uh, the FGP path and the eccentric bilateral balance. And then post Schuller, they came up with the group function. You know, they're getting better, you know, the freedom mean centric. And, and then finally we have the Peter Dawson came up with the closed concept that we are using in the modern days, the freedom from centric, the part of long centric, and I will elaborate it later at the molar point, point context, anterior area contact, and at the time they preferred group function, but no balancing context. So it's getting better. And going to the Becker and Kaiser, and now we're turn, uh, we have the biological occlusion that we are utilizing these days. You see that, so that everything has, every subject line has a history uh, behind it. And it's quite interesting to see where it's coming from. And our biological occlusion would be no interferences from COMIP context cusp to fossa relationship, at least one contact on the posterior, wide centric, and the canine guidance or group function, and no posterior interferences, elimination of all fremitus, no non-working side interferences. Uh, and so that we can achieve the immediate disocclusion with the shallow guidance uh, during the eccentric movement as well. And why are we so interested in the canine guidance? Well, canine guidance is a proven concept of occlusion where you know, the, 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 mus the involuntary muscle movement of the temporalis masseters when the canine's in contact, according to Diamico, and it becomes less, giving a less trauma to the teeth. And Williamson, you know, studied that the mutually protected occlusion lessens, you know, the traumatic occlusal scheme in the EMG, uh, you know, the activity. So we, we know that the canine, so that's, that's why we term, we have a term called canine protected occlusion, the anterior protect the posterior, posterior protect the anterior. So <clears throat> those are kinds of the occlusal foundation that you want to have when you're doing whether wax up or you know, full mouth rehabilitation. And the long century concept is, is something that you should, you, you may not be, may not necessarily be familiar with. So as I said, if you draw the basalt of the envelope uh, and you have a conventional line of you know, the C centric occlusion, centric relation occlusion. So <clears throat> we have, we term it as a deflective malocclusion. And the Panky Man Chiller, they came up with this concept of the long centric. It means we attain the same vertical, but, but at the same vertical, we have some of the leeway on the front. So due to the awkward closure, when the patient bites down, uh, we have posterior cuspal anatomy. And if we don't have the centric, uh, the long centric, 
the patient will have traumatic bite when, whenever they bite, the patient bites down. And that's actually proven by nathology uh, where they really try to have the centric relation occlusion with the centric occlusion coincidental together. And that was our concept at the very beginning of our occlusal history, but it turned out that it becomes more traumatic. So we need some of the leeway on the front in order to compensate our posterior uh, tooth anatomy in order to have a stable occlusion every time. So that's the concept that you know we are definitely applying to any full mouth rehabilitation, wax ups, or you know prosthetic uh, reconstruction. Uh, you know what I personally prefer to do is use the shim stock with very thin occlusal paper. You check in the posterior, and every time the patient bites down, not clenching, but you know bites down, we have a bilateral simultaneous contact on the posterior, followed by slight pull through of the ship stock, but the patient will have the acufilm contact on the anterior. So that's how you can evaluate when you're final cementing your crowns to, to maximize the stabilization of your occlusal reconstruction. <clears throat> and then after the anterior uh, wax up, we go on to the mock-up try-in. What the mock-up try-in is using that shape of the anterior wax up, we can make the putty out of it. Uh, and, and then we uh, use a, this acryl. And you know, a lot of times we do this for the aesthetic veneer cases. But we do this exact same mock-up for the anterior canine to canine for our full mouth rehabilitation as well. So we, what we were looking for the aesthetics and the phonetics and the dynamic relationship with this anterior guidance, you know, the excursive movements, how much space we have during the eccentric uh, movements. Uh, and the most importantly is the patient's expectation should be also confirmed along with your foundational checklist. So in this particular case, uh, for example, the patient, I personally thought this, uh, you know, I mean, this is a mono, monochromic shade anyways, but I, I suggested, uh, you know, due to his pre-existing uh, the color, uh, I suggested, you know, B1 type of, type of shade, and then the patient strongly disagreed. And then he said, I want darker color. So, you know, that's exactly wh why you need this mock-up try-in to sort of hear the patient's expectations as well. And at the end of the day, it's patient's mouth. You know, we have to, you know, provide our best care, but, you know, our main focus should be the patient's interest as well. Um, and then if you're doing the uh, digital smile design, uh, you know, these days we, we do this a lot of times. Uh, if you have a scanner in, the, in your practice and you, you can submit your DSD, uh, the planning center, and then they do the wax up. And of course, you take a lot of photographs, uh, certain photographs, uh, in order to give them the proper reference points. They can merge the scannings and then they can do the wax up and they can give you the precise, uh, you know, the dissecting, the planning of the aesthetic analysis. And then, you know, this case, I saw him about three weeks ago, uh, you know, full, full mouth prep and time of the maxilla mandible, and he's fully ready to, you know, we took a di DICOM CBCT, fully ready for the implant placement in two weeks. So, you know, these are kinds of, you know, if you have a scanner and you have a beauty of the digital technology, you can use it. But again, the foundation part is also critical. And then if you're doing conventional way of the interior wax up, if you're a process resident, uh, you know, and then you then, after checking the mock-up trying, you then move on to the posterior wax up because, you know, it doesn't, you may have to retake the bite, you know, so some of the things that you, know, you, you may have to modify and then, you know, perform the wax up. So this is another wax up that I did during my residency. And when you're doing the wax up on the posterior, what are the things that you're looking for? Well, there's very popular Thalman's formula, the high point that we are utilizing for denture balancing occlusion. We can apply the same analogy, the same concept when you're, when you're, when you're doing the posterior wax up. You know, the, the, each of the condyle inclination, incisal guidance, compensating curve, occlusal plane, cuspal height, they have all those dynamic relationship. That if you're increasing something, you're decreasing the other. So you can apply this equation to have a better, better, uh, you know, the wax, to, to more systematically do the wax up on the posterior. And, uh, you know, Talking about some of the terminologies and the occlusion very briefly, I'm not going in detail. A Bennett movement, uh, it's, it's something that you may have heard already. It's a condylar movement on the working side in the horizontal plane. It's called the lateral detrusion. And because it's on the working side, we have a different directional path, like a lateral detrusion going down, surtrusion up, retrusion back, and protrusion on the front. So 
those are some of the terms that, uh, in, you know, if you're going detail, we can explain those. And then we have Bennett angle, you know, same in the horizontal plane, we compare the sagittal plane and after the full, uh, you know, the working movement, we are looking at the non-working condyle and then you measure the difference of the angular path. And that, that gives us the Bennett angle. And remember the semi-adjustable articulator, they have all those built in, uh, you know, values that we can adjust on the articulator. And then we can apply those overcompensation under compensation concept, utilizing those Bennett angle is in there built into the articulator. And same thing to the immediate side shift. You know, we have a concept of the immediate side shift with the immediate you know, translatory portion of the lateral movement on the non-working side before going to the translational movement. And, you know, in, in, in our prosthodontic field, uh, Tom Taylor, uh, you know, came up with the research paper saying insufficient evidence on its clinical implication, even the terminology by itself. But I personally think it's, it's a great source and the immediate side shift gives us, uh, you know, it, it allow us to visualize the occlusion better with opening our eyes to, you know, to the more thorough understanding of the occlusion. You know, it's a theoretical concept allowing us to visualize the posterior dynamic occlusion correlation, although it's a clinical implication is may not be applicable at this moment in time. Um, <clears throat> so the rule number eight would be the incremental wax up anterior posterior, whether digital or conventional, uh, using the principles of the dynamic occlusion along with the mock-up triant with the patient's approval as well. And then finally, uh, we are moving on to the surgical planning. And today's lecture is not a surgical uh, lecture. It's more or less like full mouth reconstruction in general. So what, you, what you're doing is, you know, you can utilize a pre-existing dentition uh, for scanning, or you can use a denture. You know, uh, you can use a denture when the patient's missing the denti uh, dentitions. You can utilize a denture to dual scan a denture, and that gives us the, the basic framework of the tooth position, and you can plan the implants. And initially, you will have a tissue-supported guide and converting into the bone-supported guide. And you can precisely uh, do the osteotomies followed by the placing the implant fixtures inside. Uh, or you can use a wax-up. You, know, you, you can use the wax-up scanning with a DICOM CBCT, and you can plan your implant placements uh, according to the wax-up. And this is typically applicable when you're phasing your treatment. You know, if you're prep and temp certain area, and then you move on to the other segments, and then this could be uh, valuable, <coughs> the uh, treatment route for such cases. Or you can provisionalize. Uh, you know, this is the most recent case that I'm doing, the case that I showed you at the beginning, and on also for the temporization aesthetics. Uh, I use the fiducial markers on the, you know, you know, the patient tissue directly, and then you can take a DICOM file with you know, scanning, and you can merge everything together on the software where on the next visit will be implant placement because you have all those information of the prep, the, the surface information of provisional, and you, have, you can then plan all those implant positions in the software because you do have the DICOM information of the, of the, the bone structures. And, and then uh, you know, we have number, uh, number nine, uh, the surgical planning for guided implant placement, you know, CBCC DICOM file, STL surface files and do the surgical implant placement. Again, you know, you need to see the range of motion in order to really evaluate the, the, the spatial flexibility that you have. And, and really, it depends on the phases and sequences of each patient case. If you're doing guided bone regeneration or sinus lift, you know, bone augmentation, tissue augmentations, it really depends on your specific treatment plan and phases and sequences. And, you know, you can then do the surgical, you can phase your surgical placements, or you can just uh, place everything all together. And it really up to you as a reconstructive dentist, you know, you plan out your plan. Um, and then <clears throat> as execution plan uh, phase, and then now you move on to the tooth prep. You know, uh, I personally prefer to use the mock-up, you know, just like you're doing for the veneer prep, so that you can keep the minimal invasive dentistry. So the tooth preparation is like a firing a starting pistol to begin the marathon. You know, the moment the clinician starts prepping a tooth, there, there should be simultaneously the coexistence of commitment, liability, and responsibility. So, you know, despite the modern trend of advanced, like adhesive technology and minimally invasive dentistry, tooth preparation is still indispensable clinical execution in selected cases with proper indications. So, uh, especially in the field of full mouth rehabilitation. And, uh, you know, it is a re irreversible subtractive clinical procedure. Therefore, you know, before you even hold a pen piece, you should thoroughly dissect the case in and out 
ideal and alternative treatment routes, arraying the consequences of correlate risk and benefits to the patient, followed by having the consent from the patient in order to really execute this irreversible uh, treatment to the patient. And once decided, uh, once you follow such algorithmic principle of tooth preparation in arts and science, the biologic, mechanical, and aesthetic rules should serve as foundational baseline. Architectural engineering concept, as I said, the, the deriving the mathematical ratios, geometric rules, and the principles of tooth preparation. And you know, I personally use several reduction guide, uh, both with the putty and also the vacuum. And uh, you, you know, you can so that you can visualize where you're going, because you know, even if you're using the mock-up as a reference, a baseline, if you don't know how much thickness you got, there's no way you can predictably you know, visualize where you're going. So four ways to ensure you're taking off, uh, you know, several ways to, to ensure that you're going to the right direction is definitely you need to know the depth and the diameter of the, your burr. You know, you need to know the diameter of the burr because it's, it's a micro level. And sometimes we sort of underestimate the size of the burr. Uh, and because once we cut, it's gone. And, and, you know, definitely you do the depth cuts and use a template to evaluate your, your reduction every time you do the reduction. And after you do the systematic reduction, this is how this is kinds of tooth preparation you will get. We apply the principles of tooth preparation, biologic, mechanical, aesthetics, you name it. We, we apply all those concepts into the tooth preparation and we follow the Parker Gudakri's, you know, retention resistance form. You know, how much, you know, the width and the, the height of the tooth preparation. And in order to have proper retention and resistance, we need to consider several factors like a taper of the tooth, a diameter, height, surface area, surface roughness. And sometimes we utilize the boxes and grooves on the posterior teeth to increase the retention um, and the height of the crown as well. And we may consider the biologic considerations like a pulpal, you know, whether it will be close to the endo pulp or adjacent teeth, how is the periodontal status of the adjacent teeth. Uh, and the preservation of the tooth structure is also a critical component. So all those things, when you're prepping your tooth, you're not just reducing the tooth structure, you're applying all the science and knowledge foundation behind it, along with your arts and the clinical skills. And I personally pack a cord or Teflon tape during my initial prep, and my initial prep is always almost the full reduction of the preparation so that I can manipulate the, I can allow the time, the papilla to heal up with polish uh, the, the embrasure space. Um, so, you know, you need to know dimensionally how much tooth structure you're going to reduce as a 3D dimensionally. And off, uh, obviously, you should know when you're prepping your tooth, the choice of the fitted material you're going to use for the final processes. And the interior tooth, I, I, I almost always perform the bone sounding, which is, you know, probing your all the way to the crestal bone, and the mid-facial especially, where we can't really visualize on the x-ray. And if it's more than three millimeters, I tend to prep a little dipper on the subgingival area to prevent any of the margin exposure layer, uh, which is quite commonly seen. Um, <clears throat> if you're making all of those beautiful crowns, and later you have margin exposure, it's, it's not a pleasure experience. And again, the hygiene maintenance is absolutely critical throughout the treatment. And as you can see, the patient is ma managing their tissues, uh, tissue health quite well on all of my full mouth reconstructive cases because I motivate them. And uh, we move on to the temp shell. You know, this is the fabricating temp shell that I performed during my residency. Uh, you know, I'm not doing it anymore. You know, we have a milling, uh, you know, capability in private practice setting. But again, we are learning the foundation. If you're there any process residents here, you know, feel free to try and error and try as much as you can because that will give you uh, true understanding of handling acrylic. You know, if you don't do those steps in a conventional way, you will never be able to learn. If you just meal the temporary, you, know, you won't be able to learn the conventional way. It's also very important, you know. Um, it's a great way of learning how to, you know, handle those with the basic principles behind the shelf fabrication. And, you know, we have scannings and we can meal the PMMA and these are types of you know, treatment route in a, in a normal private practice uh, and that we can reline reference with the palatal references and uh, we can reline predictably. And you have a temp shell and you have a prep teeth and you're about to reline. What are the things that you should consider? Well, 
especially if you don't have opposing arch, it's really sometimes it's challenging to see where you are when you're relining your temporary. So I personally prefer to reline on the maxilla first with the fox plane. With the fox plane, when you reline, you can see the extra oral references and you can precisely, you know, assuming your wax up is ideal, you can keep the occlusal plane as a reference line. And then you can, you, you know, and, and then after that, you can reline the opposing arch if you already prep and temp the maxilla and mandible together simultaneously. And uh, when you're relining, in this case, it's the upper denture. And then I created those aiding jig where you can precisely locate this temp shell and let the patient uh, you know, bite down so that you can precisely preserve your occlusal surfaces uh, along with the biting aid. You can be as much creative as possible you know, for, for those type of inserting the, the, temp, the temp shell. And this is how it looks after the adjustments. And the critical part for the temporary, as you all may well know, clear margins, ovate pontic site, highly polished. So we're sort of stimulating the epithelial tissue with the desmosomes and the embrasure spaces on the ovate pontic sites, uh, near the ovate pontic site as well. So those are kinds of things that you want to, you know, sort of put into your, your checklist when you're doing the temporary relining. And, and this is just a temp shell uh, relining technique with implants. Uh, you know, the, the critical part is you preserve your occlusal surface interdigitation first and then reline the patient according to the occlusion. And sometimes if you're lacking the insufficient uh, interdigitation surfaces, I purposely create more surface contact with melted compound so that you can, when you're asked the patient bite down, you have precise uh, you know, repeatable uh, location where you can precisely uh, reline your temporary crown because you, you do all those wax up and make a temp shell and reline it and later you have a discrepancy, a little angular angular discrepancy, all of a sudden you have interferences, there's no meaning of the wax up. You, I, I would have just do the block pen, right? So uh, temp shell with a specific uh, repeatable uh, reinserting pathway is critical. And and then, you know, when you're doing relining the full mouth, re, uh, full mouth uh, cases, sometimes, you know, you have to phase your, your treatment. Sometimes you place your implants and they utilize the teeth supported full arch temp until you, the full arch integration of the implants. In such cases, I sometimes utilize both implant and tooth, but, you know, definitely we don't want to connect them together, but sort of utilize it as a pseudo a tooth prep type of support. So, you know, after you put a healing cap, you can reline your temporary shell and they use a, use a tissue conditioner to make sure you have a primary uh, stress bearing area from the tooth prep. And then you're all, only occluding on the top coronal portion of the healing cap. In that way, we are not generating any of the axial forces, non-axial forces to the implants, but we are just putting compressive forces to the healing cap. So that's one of my techniques that I utilize. Uh, and at the e it's very easy to handle whenever you take your temporary on and off. It's very efficient. So that's my preferable way. Uh, you can choose to engage the implants, but a lot of, like most of the time, I don't necessarily engage implant because, you know, you have to take everything out in, in, in like a few minutes. It's not really efficient if you engage your implants. Um, and then th th these are the videos of the temporary, full arch temporary after a few weeks, inserting provisional. Remember, the patient's oral hygiene maintenance is absolute cri critical component. And at this moment in time, patient and I, we're in the same boat. Like he, there's no question patient's not maintaining their oral hygiene. If I don't see the improvement in oral hygiene, I don't, I don't prep the tooth, you know? And then at this moment in time, when the patient has a provisional, I fully expect the patient to maintain his or her oral hygiene, uh, especially in the embrasure area. You know, that's a critical area I want to allow the, the papilla to grow back to the embrasure space. So I purposely create some of the embrasure space with a sharp spine angle so that we are sort of expecting the epithelial tissue to grow back to the position. So if the patient doesn't do the oral hygiene properly, there's no way we are moving forward. And uh, I, I always emphasize to the patient this part and patient also appreciate that. And, um, and then, you know, we generate the biological occlusion with the even temporaries, you know, this will become the blueprint of our future definitive processes. So we need to create the biological occlusion, immediate disocclusion, bilateral simultaneous shim stop contact on the posterior, immediate shallow disocclusion on the eccentric movements. And then we check the aesthetics, we check the phonetics. And 
get the patient's approval, and then ask the patient whether there's anything that we can check. Because this is another case that, you know, fully temporized. And, you know, to me, it looked, it looked beautiful. And the patient requested darker shade and also some of the natural recession looking on the inside the area. Those things you can, you know, definitely suggest to the patient up front. But, you know, some of the details, some of the crazy lines, maybe, the patient requ can, can request all those modifications along the line of the provisional phase. So it's critical to sort of fine tune your attention to the patient's request or you know, modification as necessary. And, uh, you know, I would say the provisionalization will be the fine tuning process in that purpose. And, you know, when you're preparing for the impr implant uh, impression, I, I, if it's a full mouth, no doubt, I always prefer to use open tray impression coping, the literature is saying like close tray, open tray, not, not significant, but I prefer to use open tray uh, impression coping to minimize any potential error from myself. So, you know, I, I and then I, <clears throat> you know, you can either splint them either intraoral, extraoral. Uh, I prefer the extraoral for the full mouth rehabilitations. You use a temporary crown, let the gypsum stone set, and then you put it lab analogs and you, you preserve the tissue area so that you can create the embrasure, uh, you can create, you can mimic the, the emergence profile on the impression coping itself. And then I use the pre-polymerized GC pattern resin more than 24 hours. So you're just minimizing any discrepancies of the polymerization shrinkage so that you can splint those impression copings, let them set in the 24 hours and you're ready to go. And as I said, the emergence profile should be preserved as well. And this is another case, uh, the diagnostic phase actually, when the patient presents and then if you place the implants and you're questionable about the direction of the implants, uh, by the way, these are Strauman bone level uh, implants at the, at the tissue level on the posterior. And I was questionable whether I can get a passivity. And it's something that if you're doing the full mouth rehab and implant supported rehab, it's, it's absolutely critical to, to check the passivity, at, especially at the phase of the impression. And because if you don't know the passivity and they use an open tray impression coping and you know, your impression, the whole assembly can be locked in the patient's mouth. So in this case, uh, I was questionable the angulation. I didn't place the implant, so I didn't know the angulation information. So what I did was uh, I, you know, you can choose to, you know, use a close tray impression technique and then, you know, you can do the same exact same procedure, but I did the open tray impression technique with the ortho wire in it, flexible ortho wire, but rigid at the same time little bit of pop, the salt and paper, uh, salt and pepper on the pattern resin, and then you, you take the uh, impression with it. And what you do is you perform the passivity test at extra oral in the laboratory setting and see if you can get a passivity in the section of different sectional information. And then you figure out where there is a passivity or where there is no passivity. And then ultimately what you want to do is the, you, you want to check that passivity and then you know cut that you know, on the day of impression. You, you cut a little minimal segment and dilute the area that has a passivity that's already confirmed extra orally. So you're sure that when you take your impression assembly out, you're sure that you can disengage everything together. Because if you don't do the passivity test intraorally, it could be a disaster. And if you're using the multi you know the botments uh, these days in the full mouth rehab, and then you, you know, sometimes you use a stone jig uh, the, as, as well. And this is, uh, I, I created, so it's not super aesthetic, but you know, you can request your laboratory to, to make a stone jig as well. So if it's a passivity, uh, if it's not fully passive sit, uh, there, there will be a crack on the, the stone and then you can re -loop them before the taking impression. And this is how it looks uh, when you insert every impression copings and uh, you, know, you can realize that I try to preserve the obey pontic sites on the number eight and nine site. Because you know, if you're doing any implant cases, you can appreciate how amazing our tissue biology is. You know, once you remove the healing cap, your tissue will just close up within weeks. Same thing to the apotic site. Same thing to the, uh, the emergence profile. When you remove anything from that preserved architecture, uh, it will collapse. It will just natural phenomenon that it will just collapse in a minute. Obeypontic will be rebound. So it's it's critical to preserve whatever information you achieve with the internal processes, you preserve that uh, with the impression copings as well. So here I use the GC pattern on the number eight and nine site, and the, some of the embrasure, uh, the, uh, some of the emergence profile uh, on the posterior tube. And the custom tray fit in. 
you know, you fit in the custom tray, see the passive fit, and uh, you know, the way, whether the patient feels comfortable, whether it's not impinging any area, any sharp area, you verify pre-fit this before taking impression. And uh, obviously at this moment in time, the soft tissue should be no question, healthy, biologic width, patient should maintain, should have been maintaining the soft tissue in an excellent way. If not, then, you know, again, I wouldn't have prepped the tooth. Uh, and I prefer to put a first cord, uh, it does a triple zero cord most of the time, or a little piece of Teflon tape. And the purpose of the initial cord, and I, and I use a double cord technique, uh, and I, you put the initial cord at the vertical pushing, and your second cord will be the horizontal pushing. So uh, the key thing is to create uh, you know, in, in, in this impression technique and a chair visit, you create your own time sensitive impression protocol based on your material of choice, polymerization setting time, structural integrity of the impression, speed of the removing second cord by yourself, speeding of speed of injecting the impression through the tiny little tip. Are you going to cut the tip or not? So all of those should be fine costume, customized on your own, and then you can create the most predictable impression technique on your own. So there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and this is also another case with the impression coping with, you know, the, the, the preserving the soft tissue, the parent plant soft tissue with uh, the emergence profile with a, with a foldable composite. And when, it, when everything's ready, you know, uh, at this moment, you insert your implant, implant impression coping, take the bite wing at a radiograph, and you're ready to go. And you know, the digital impression has been amazing. However, in my humble opinion, it's not quite practical in the full mouth reconstructive cases, especially with the multiple subchangeable margins in the anterior area. Inevitably, you need to you know put the cord, and it will have a, it will have a very time sensitive, uh, you know, the, the time sensitive time sensitivity when you're taking impression. So the saliva control is absolutely critical. It's very important because before taking impression. I selectively block wherever the major salivary glands with the dry angles, proper suction, tip alignment, and the even dual side suctioning if necessary. If the patient salivates a lot, then you can even prescribe anti-salivary medication before the final impression visit. And I occasionally do. And this is type of impression that you will look after, you know, following all those protocols. And then, you know, it's critical not to over compress the impression a lot of times when I teach the students at school, they, they tend to like press it. And you know, remember, this is a polymerization process. The silicone with the polyvinyl siloxane is a polymerization. So when it's polymerizing, when you're over compressing, you're sort of creating those discrepancies of the micro discrepancies can be a huge difference on the posterior of the tooth. So when you're holding the impression, let it set and as if you're holding a baby, you know, you just hold it there. And then definitely your assistant would keep in track with a stopwatch. After the initial polymerization, you see the patient upright and keep holding and the patient breathe your, their nose and you should inspect for no bubbles, irregularities on the margin. That's the absolute critical aspect. And if there is a little bubble on the crown prep, it should be okay because you're gonna do the die spacer anyways. And uh, if the pocket depth's not more than three millimeters, I personally prefer to put the both cords out and then blowing the air, the impression, so that it can surround all the way to the sub uh, you know, the architecture of the, the, the tissue, uh, so that the, when we pour up the cast, we have the full dynamics of the sub area so that the lab technician can have, you know, better grasp uh, when they're doing the wax for the final processes. So that's my personal preference. Uh, sometimes, you know, most of the time, I also do, you know, double core technique and taking the initial core, uh, the second core out only. Um, but when you're doing it, uh, be careful uh, not to overpack the second cord. Because a lot of times, uh, you may unintentionally take the, the initial cord out if you put the second cord too deep. So those are some of the clinical tips that you can develop yourself as well. Um, but uh, those are my fifty cents. So so here's a face bow uh, again. You know, I always do it on my, my full mouth rehabilitation cases. Uh, particularly, I'm utilizing the same adjustable articulator, uh, our tech CR articulator, and you do the uh, the shade selection. And the important thing is, you know, hue chroma value rules. You know, you want to align your the shade guide as parallel and as same depth of information as possible to your target tooth. 
And real, you know, realistically, you know, I, I don't really use a polarized uh, lens for the full mouth reconstruction because we don't have any reference to. We are rehabilitating everything together, so you know, I, I don't really use it. But you can take a polarized or some of the most uh, some of the basic information of the prep shade, uh, prep tooth shade, so that the lab technician can have a more thorough understanding. But the bottom line is, you take a shade information, and uh, I personally take the shade information from the patient's eye, you know. Because to the uh, you know when the patient look at the shade guide, everything looks white. You know what I mean. So when you sort of guide the patient in a systematic way, you'll be like, look, your your eye color is similar to this shade color. So why don't we try this color? And then sort of persuading the patient, patients you know, devoting and they're committing all those finance and effort and time commitment, and they want to know that you're approaching a more systematic way versus you know, ask the patient what color they like, and then just go for that color. Um, and, and you take the bite registration. Uh, it's absolutely critical to take the bite registration. Uh, and later, I will elaborate the cross mounting technique. But, um, you know, I personally prefer to use a GC pattern resin with a micro thickness of the shim stock and generate the patient bite down. And segmentally, I verify, I take the bite and verify and remember the verification process. I do the each step, the verification, every single segment of my bite. And then when you when you take the cross mounting, the basic analogy is you, you take the bite of the, the maxillary provisional versus you know mandibular provisional, and then maxillary provisional with a mandibular prep, and then mandibular prep, uh, mandibular provisional with a maxillary prep, and then ultimately the prep versus prep. So later I'll 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 explain how the cross mounting works. But unless you're planning to finish one arch first, and then later you do this, this you know, the other arch finish uh, as a phased approach. If you're planning to finish uh, the maxilla mandibular altogether, which is my preference, uh, and the patient appreciate that more. Um, if so, then cross mounting process is absolutely critical, and we should not forgive any of those micro level of discrepancy on the posterior. So therefore, sometimes when you do the try and I, I re-verify my bite, you know, in this case, a PFM bridge. I use a zinc oxide eugenol to get the little, uh, you know, a lot more finer type of occlusion on the posterior and then re-verify your bite and see if where, uh, see if what you've attained is, is, is the same at this moment in time with the framework. So occlusion, uh, the bite registration, it doesn't mean that you take it and finish. You continuously re-verify uh, whenever you're moving on. And, and, and these are the master casts that, you know, when you take the proper impression, you know, all those techniques that I elaborated, you will get those master casts. And, and, you know, in my opinion, they term as master casts because they need to be handled by masters. We have master technicians so that, you know, you, you also should be the master clinicians for this. So these are type of, you know, master casts that you will attain if you take an impression in a proper way and a proper, you're customized you know, sequential process uh, with your assistant as a teamwork, and, and you will be able to attain these type of quality, uh, the master cast, and then you can move on to the next step. So as, uh, as our next, uh, you know, rules, number 10, surgical placement of the implants uh, using the guided surgery and the systematic tooth preparation, intraoral mock-up, depth cut using the reduction guide, and you do the proper provisionalization with the temp shells followed by predictable relining and splinting impre implant impression copings uh, with the passivity test, uh, followed by double cord packing technique uh, the extra, extra caution of the hemorrhage and the final impression face bow shade selection um, and bite registration. So the cross mounting is something like, something look like this after you attain all those information, you get the face bow, you get the aesthetic uh, information, the interpupillary line, all the trigus line, midline, and you have already poured up the master cast, both maxilla and the mandible. You have provisional cast, diagnostic cast, everything is compiled together and then you either mount your cast to yourself or send to the lab. I personally prefer to have every cast ready and I personally prefer to mount my cast for the cross mounting myself with my own articulator and send it to the lab technician so that if there's any discrepancy when I return the processes back from the lab technician, and if I cannot articulate with a shim stock on the articulator, I send them back. So I have an excuse 
you know, look, I, I have all those mountings, everything was correct, and then I don't have a bite. So they can, the lab technician can also appreciate that process because, you know, at the end of the day, we are, our goal is to give the best quality care to the patient. So, you know, I'm sure the lab technician will appreciate that as well. So the cross mounting in terms of process as a sequence would be, uh, as I said, you, you sequentially take the bite registration and then mount the cast, the maxillary temporary cast with your face for preservation and then maxillary temp cast with a mandibular temporary cast and the maxillary temp cast with the mandibular prep cast, mandibular prep cast, maxillary prep cast, and the maxillary prep cast with the mandibular temp cast. So ultimately you do the sequential mounting of the, until the very end where you can do so-called verification of your mounting. After you mount your two last casts, and then when you verify with your bite registration in triorally capture, if there's any discrepancy, you know that there's something wrong with the mounting. So that's the concept of the cross mounting. It's absolutely critical uh, if you're doing the maxillary mandibular arch uh, together at the same time. It's quite challenging, but it's, you know, you can do it. And the patient really appreciate that. And, you know, when you're fabricating you know, the, the, the wax up for the final processes, you do the biologic occlusion, you know, as you did on the wax up as well. The cross mounting is critical, you know, as I said, if you're inserting both maxilla and mandible together, and I, I really prefer to complete both arches simultaneously because patient feels more satisfied and appreciative. And the digital workflow has been absolutely essential in modern dentistry, no question. Even if you take the conventional impressions, the laboratory will scan the model and design the wax digitally, followed by milling final processes. So, you know, with the digital workflow, still the conventional lost wax technique can be applied for, in this case, with the Emax press processes. And you know it's still possible, so the hybrid way of digital and conventional together, and um, you know, so that we can maximize the the, uh, the maximize the aesthetic product outcome. If it's a bridge, I prefer to use a PFZ bridge. Uh, the force infuses zirconia on the interior, but with the proper cutback by the laboratory, it can be a, is a very good option. And the monolithic zirconia on the posterior. <laughs> We still do the gold crowns, PFM bridges, depending on the indicated cases, the patient's preferences. Uh, you know, they have the longest track of record in the clinical and literatures. So I still do such type of restorations. But, but most of the time, you know, we, we do the milling and, you know, uh, more on the, uh, the Emax crowns, zirconia, porcelain type of processes. And the Vita Trilope is, is a milled monolithic multichromatic porcelain. So, with a proper bonding protocol and the retention resistance forms, we can expect excellent quality work done with these type of processes as well. And if you send a high quality cast and mounting, we'll inevitably work with a master technician who will get back to us with master pieces. So for a full mouth, full arch implant rehabilitation, I personally prefer a monolithic zirconia with a facial cutback if necessary. And these days we have superior characterization techniques on the monolithic zirconia as well. So when we receive the cases, uh, we check the occlusion, as I said, with the shim stock, uh, and then we always, you know, re-verify the extra oral information before seeing, seeing the, the patient. I personally shim stock every single tooth on the articulator, uh, verifying the bite before it's, you know, even booking my patient chair. And I, I prefer, as I said, I prefer to cross mount myself with my articulators. So, so the lab, technician, lab technicians have the precise starting information and reference to start with. And on the day of delivery, uh, I would like to emphasize utilizing the Teflon tape. I'm sure many of you are already utilizing Teflon tape. It's one of the amazing armamentarium that I utilize uh, in everyday daily practices. You know, as you can see, we can use it as a barrier, but you can even roll it up a little bit and the as a core pack and, and you know you can you can do all those uh you know the isolation protocol i mean you can use the uh, the rubber dam but if once you prep your tooth or you have a very little the retention resistance form then you, you know it's, it's very challenging to use a rubber dam on every single prep tooth for the full mouth rehabilitation cementation process so i prefer to use a step on tape and then you know you can at least block the crevicular fluid area and then you control the extra uh, the the other area of the salivary glands with, you know, the, the bite, the, the dry angles, the cut rolls, you know, the bilateral suction tips, and you can control those saliva. And then you do those acid etch bonding protocols. 
and uh, you know you can do predictable cementation. And the beauty of the Teflon tape, if you roll it in the subgingival uh, regions, after cementation, you can roll, you can re-roll it up, and then this becomes a sort of floss, and it, it can give you a clean uh, cleaning aid as well. Uh, you know, after cementing the crown. So I, I, I personally prefer to use a Teflon tape a lot. Um, but you, you can create your own um, of, the, of uh, techniques. That's the beauty of prosthetics. You know, the healthy tissue, oral hygiene maintenance, no question is, is a must during any full mouth rehabilitation. Subgingival margins on the interior with bone sounding, as I mentioned, allows us to expect the margins uh, in, in, in a long way uh, as a prognosis wise. Uh, less being exposed in the near future. And <clears throat> sometimes we use a pink porcelain to the lost tissue site when the patient does not prefer to have the vertical uh, the bone augmentations. And the monolithic technology has been improving every day. And the obey pontic sites are well developed in, in this case uh, with a bridge with, pro with proper provisionalization and polishing surfaces. And, and you know the desmosomes epithelial tissue will adhere to the polished surfaces, and that that's why I prefer to use OVA pontic sites of any of those uh, edentulous um, the prosthetic regions. So if you're using custom abutments, uh, in which I, I think perfectly fine to use it uh, with a pre cementation technique, uh, you can predictably utilize the cement retained implant processes, and you can control these excess cement and clean them well. Um, <clears throat> And again, you know, when you're achieving the occlusion, you always think about the Becker and Kaiser's uh, the biological occlusion. You know, from the very beginning where you did the diagnosis to the provisionalization, uh, to the wax up followed by the provisionalization up until to the final delivery of the definitive processes. Occlusion is absolutely critical component in a realm of full mouth reconstruction. One thing you take out of this lecture, as I said, is oral hygiene improvement. If, when the patient comes, you def definitely demonstrate the patient with a water floss, electric toothbrush. To me, this is a game changer in my journey of the full mouth rehab to all of my patient cases. And after you deliver the crowns and definitive processes, you deliver the occlusal guard, protective occlusal guard, and instruct the patient, you know, wear this um, every night. And you do the recall. You do the one week, one month three month, one year, depending on your preference and patient status, you design your recall and maintains, you check the occlusal guard, see if the patient is wearing them, and occlusion with a shim stock, margin checks, and hygienes as well. So, you know, the, the, the rule number 16, already we're 16, the cross mounting with the shim stock verification, that's absolutely critical. 17 would be thorough communication with the lab technician for fabricating masterpieces of your processes. 18 would be delivering definitive processes using Teflon tape technique. And 19 will be fabricating a protective occlusal guard with a biological occlusal concept, followed by the recall and follow up. So in full mouth rehabilitation, uh, it's critical to attain not only the foundational knowledge, but also clinical skills to provide smooth treatment flow to the patient who is about to go through a life changing experience. Uh, once you demonstrate your genuine care and passion towards the patient's rehabilitation, the patient will also be motivated and start changing their everyday habits into non-destructive equilibrium status. It is then absolutely critical for us, the reconstructive dentist, being, being responsible and fully committed to this reconstructive treatment, not only studying foundational knowledge, but also continuously trying to be a better clinician every day. And if any other craftsmanship exists, attention to details makes a huge difference in terms of quality at the end of the day. And most likely for such type of full mouth rehab, uh, you will have to work with a master technician. If so, I believe we also should become master providers at the clinical arena. And one thing I love about prosthodontics is that if you follow the basic principle, there is no right or wrong answer. Within the foundational rationale, you can become as creative as possible. So successful, successful reconstructive dentistry is powerful. It, it is such a phenomenal life-changing experience in which someone who used to suffer from deteriorated oral health, low self-esteem, pain, depression can now normally function, chew, speak, smile with confidence. It's a journey of patience. Full mouth rehab is not a one-day procedure or rather a systematic sequential process 
necessitating a comprehensive approach or proper steps and phases without the shortcuts, which may take months to years. It is a collaborative resolving of two critical factors, a clinician devoting time and energy to excel in both knowledge and clinical skills to confidently and competently to handle the treatment, a patient improving oral hygiene and maintenance care to keep as non-destructive equilibrium status. It is an outcome of a consistent commitment. You know, successful reconstructive dentistry is only achievable with a simultaneous bilateral effective continuous effort from both clinician and the patient during the whole process of preparation in process and the post-treatment. It is one of the most touching real life stories that being able to observe and go through this meaningful transformative adventure with my patients is truly fascinating with great humbleness and gratitude. I know that the majority of the audiences today are either graduate prosthodontics residents at UFM and uh, dental students around the world. But for me, being a prosthodontist was one of the best life, lifetime decisions I've ever made so far. I would like to encourage every one of you uh, to excel in your own field of specialty and continue, continuously strive or the excellence in patient care as becoming a better clinician than yesterday. So that was it for my lecture today. Uh, I think I was about time. Yesterday when I pre-run, it was about three hours, but <laughs> I was able to finish in two hours today. So thank you very much. These are my websites, uh, LinkedIn and Instagram um, links. If you want to follow and then ask questions, anytime you're welcome to do so. so that's pretty much it. Uh, and I think uh, we <clears throat> we are accepting any questions if you have and any questions you can ask, and uh, this is the right time to do so. Dr. Kim, once again, thank you so much for an amazing presentation, amazing cases. I'm still baffled by how your preps are so precise. So <laughs> just congratulations on how you work. Your workflow is amazingly detailed. And that, I think that's the um, that's the ten percent extra that you must give, right? The attention to detail. Impressive presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So we're gonna take some questions. Um, no questions yet. Just says very impressive presentation and cases. Chicos, si tienen alguna pregunta, ahora es cuando. I think everything was very well explained that nobody has any questions, Dr. Kim. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for attending the lecture. Uh, it was my pleasure during this COVID outbreak. Um, I wish everybody stay safe. And um, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Um, I'm hoping to have you down here in Guatemala when the airport's open and everything goes back to normal again. Okay? I'll be happy to be there. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right, man. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Eh? Take care.